You're listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast brought to you by DraftKings. Great deal going on right now. You throw down a dollar on an NBA game, and if that team wins, you get $150 in free plays. Bet on the Warriors. They're good. All right. Ryan now joined. Very, very excited to be finally joined by Ryan Hansen, a man that I've been listening to for, it feels like, about 35 years. But before that, Rhino was also the manager on a team that, you know, did some pretty good things here at the U of A, you know, not, not too bad, but we're going to talk about all that and more. But first and foremost, Rhino, covering this team up close, being able to give your opinion, you and Brian Jeffries, obviously, what has it been, what has it been like watching this team right here? Well, let me start real quick, Mike, with uh, I love talking with you. Uh, I love talking Arizona basketball with anybody, Mm -hmm. but there are I I would argue there's very few people that have the depth and breadth of the experience and knowledge that I think I can bring to the table and Brian Jeffries can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And you are definitely right up there with me for not only the appreciation of the past, but uh, your recollection and recall is is outstanding. So now on to the task at hand. Mm -hmm. Um, This team has been everything and more than what you would what you're seeing yourself right we we've talked about this not really ranked coming in low expectations which for Arizona basketball is rare but right. we're in that low expectations situation right now but to watch Tommy not only bring guys along in the off season but then to watch what he's doing in getting these guys better as the games go by individually better collectively better, making adjustments uh, on the fly. It has been phenomenal to watch the growth of this team and to see, holy cow, where's that ceiling? And I'm sure we'll get into that. You know what? It's funny. Like we were texting a little bit before the show because I was, I was excited and I, you know, I was realizing I'm like, man, I can't, I can't divulge everything here. But Rhino, for me, the biggest thing with this team is the margin for error that they walk into every game with. And I'll give you the example, the Tennessee game. Arizona played as bad as you can play that first 10 minutes. I want to I want to say they had 10, 12 turnovers in the first 10 minutes. You're at Tennessee. You kind of got – I'm not a big blame the ref guy, but you got kind of jobbed in that game, I think it's mm-hmm. fair to say. And, by the way, Tennessee's a top 25 team. And, oh, by the way, you could have easily won that game playing maybe your worst game of the year. That's when it really started to dawn on me, Rhino – that you're dealing with a different animal right here that they don't need to bring their best game. You want to bring their best game, but they can beat a lot of really high powered teams without doing that. Yeah. Come and say tournament time, you need the biggest margin for error possible for that night that you're just not dropping in threes for that night that the calls just don't go your way for that night where you can't stop Frank Kaminsky. And I can't believe I dropped a Frank oh, Kaminsky line this early in the call, but it's true, right? right? There are so many of those factors that come into play and this Arizona version of this team is built in such a way that we have seen proven now they can play fast, they can play slow, they can play big, they can play small, they can hit threes, they can get to the free throw line, they can play against a zone. I mean, they shredded the Washington zone after that first couple of minutes and made it look really bad. Oh, by the way, it's still a very good zone. So seeing that versatility for Arizona gives you some hope and promise. It's a team that can play together and share the ball and who do you stop? You know, Mm -hmm. those questions become there or at any given time in an NCAA tournament run, you need to have the best player on the floor play at his best. And I think Ben Matherin is emerging to that point where he might be the best player on the floor in any given tournament game. And when you need a bucket, he can go get it. Now he's got to develop a little more and we got to see it, but all those factors combined to a large margin of error. I'm glad you brought Ben Matherin up because let's let's go there for a second. Because when I watch Arizona, there hasn't been one game this season. And, and again, I know that he's he's been up and down. He's a sophomore. He's a young kid. 
But there hasn't been one game this year where I didn't think that he was the be- wasn't the best player, the most gifted player on the court. And they played, as you know, Rhino, they played UCLA, they played Illinois, they played USC. He, to me, just looks different, even if the box score at the end of the game doesn't indicate that. Yeah, and he's not infallible by any means, right? right? He, he is uh, still needs to work on his ball handling. Uh, I still think he needs to understand the difference between getting all the way to the rim and stop and pop. Mm-hmm. He has such great athleticism mm-hmm. that stop and pop 15-footer could be one of his go-to moves, let alone a punch-counterpunch, which I always love talking about. But a man that can score at all three levels, uh, I think he could be better defensively, but he's still exceptionally gifted mm-hmm. and talented on the defensive end and agree with you wholeheartedly when Ben Matherin is right, Arizona becomes elite. Arizona is a great team, but when Ben is right and the look in his eye, and I felt like I wasn't at the games at the Washington series, Reggie Geary does a great job and called Mm -hmm. those games, but I was at the Arizona state game and there was a different look in his eye. And I'm just starting to hope and feel like middle of February the lights turned on. For right. Him and he's right. ready to go. But, well, let's talk about another guy with a different look in his eye, and that's Dalen Terry. So mm-hmm. tell you a funny story. So I first saw Dalen Terry when he was a freshman at uh, Corona del Sol. I had heard about him. I like what in-state kids that are like local kids, not the prep school kids. I'm always kind of a sucker for. And so I went and watched him and I see this kid. He's mm-hmm. super long, super gangly. You can tell he's probably going to end up being tall, had no offense whatsoever, but you could tell that he understood the game. And when you watch him up close, I think that might be the most underrated aspect because people talk about his defense, Rhino, but the way that he is able to be that secondary, not quite a one, but a one and a half type ball handler, he can initiate an offense. He's a a good passer. He's got a lot of Iggy slash Rondé Hollis Jefferson to him. And I think fans are really starting to appreciate that. Oh, there's no doubt that Dalen is a fan favorite and he fills the stat sheet. The comparisons are natural and they do make sense with Andre. I would put Dalen up there and I'm glad you mentioned that his his basketball IQ, his feel for the game, his vision, I actually think is more important to Arizona than his yes. defensive stopper mentality. Mm-hmm. And and I've been covering the team or with the team uh, in some capacity since the early 90s. Right. So I have a pretty Oh, we're going to get to some of your background. Uh, well, sure. Thank you. I have a pretty broad depth and breadth yeah. of the program to be able to see who in this team does or who in this era does he maybe compare to and I think it is not uh, a far comparison from a vision, passing, all of those things. Luke Walton Andre Gadala, you know, he's up there. Mm-hmm. I have found myself actually elbowing Brian Jeffries right. in a jaw-dropping moment uh, on a Dalen Terry pass, be it a 70-foot outlet pass from one the free right. throw line extended on our end of the floor to Pella Larson catch and finish to he had a pass to Azulis Tabellis in the USC game. Right. I fell out of my chair because I had the perfect angle from where I was sitting courtside where – I even said it on the air. It was like he passed it through the eye of the needle. It was the opening was so small, but he put it right on point, the perfect pace, and it was an and one for Azulis. And you're born, and you know this better than anybody. You're born with that. You either have that or you don't. You can work on your passing ability, but Mike Bibby was able to pass the way that he was from probably the time he was in sixth grade. Uh, uh, Luke Almost Walton. sacrilegious that I didn't include Mike Bibby uh-huh. in that Luke Walton Andre. So thank you for that catch. But by, you're right, you are born with it. By the way, one of my favorite things to bring up, and uh, Brian brought it up here before, and this is off topic, but you know what? We're nerding out right here. Okay. Brian and most people, I think, uh, talk about uh, you know Sean Elliott uh, being the best player, and Brian certainly, uh, <laughs> Brian certainly had all kinds of kind words to say. But he said if he had to start a team, he would take Bibby. Just because the way that he could control the game, not necessarily that he was better than Sean, but because of the way he can control the game. And obviously that's your partner right there. So it just kind of brought back a memory right there. Uh, so. He's he's definitely right on Mike Bibby's abilities. And and you think about what he was able to accomplish in two short years at Arizona. It, it goes without saying. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this team that I want to go back. Um this team reminds me a little bit of 87-88. And here I hear my comparison out here. In that 87-88 was thought of its team. could be a tournament team, no doubt. But nobody was looking at them and saying that's a top five team. 
obviously Sean was really about to emerge onto the national scene. Steve's coming back, obviously. But when you look at it, it was just a well-constructed, well-put-together team. Now, the comparisons don't all fit, but you got AC at the center position along Christian Coloco. Eh. Uh, Tabellas, Tom Tolbert, Ben obviously isn't Sean, not saying that, but you know, but the way that they're kind of constructed and the way Rhino that they are just annihilating teams. If you go into a game against Arizona and you're not as talented as them, you're not going to win. Now, knock on wood, I don't you know, want to jinx them on that, but it's got a, kind of an overwhelming dominant feel to it. Thoughts on that? Because I know you've got some thoughts too. Yeah, I definitely look at that 87-88 team as kind of hallowed ground. Mm -hmm, and, for and sure. You touched on a few things. Uh, it would be irreverent of us to say that Ben Matherin is where Sean Elliott was, right? right. All-time leading scorer in the conference when he left, uh, only to be eclipsed by by a UCLA player mm -hmm. unnamed on this Correct. podcast. Good. We will not name that player. Uh, but when I look at the 87-88 team and see the dominance, as you said, so let's, let's actually go back. So mm -hmm you know, not heralded coming into the season. And let's put this in perspective. Lou Olson had yet to win a tournament game right. until the 87, 88 season. A lot of people think we were on the map. We right. had not won a tournament game until that year. So right. had kind of a coming out party at the great Alaska shootout and off we go, right? 35 and three record dominant offensive team. Uh, we, you and I looked at this and said, okay, no advanced metrics like right. the Ken Palm stats to really compare efficiency, but but when you look at that offense, you could argue it's better than this offense. Mm -hmm. uh, it averages right about the same number of points. The field goal percentage, 54% shooting from the field, a 48% from the right. three-point line. They didn't turn it over. They were blowing teams out. You could argue, though, Arizona's defense this year mm -hmm. is much better. And I started looking at this, right? So just to compare, let's look at field goal percentage offense and field goal percentage defense and that delta right that delta in 87 88 is 11.7 percent do you know what the delta is this year 11.9 percent right so wow. when you talk about dominant margin for error you know who is beating teams and not just beating them but putting a hurt on them uh, there's only one other team that even compares closely to that in the last 50 years of a spread, and that's actually the 91 team uh, from uh, from a couple of years later that's also 11.7%. But when you look at that, that's where Arizona's defense this year, I think, puts them in maybe in a better position for the deepest run possible because you have to have both. Well, and that's the thing, too, is when you get to the tournament, obviously a win's a win, and people always bring up 96, 97, but that is such an aberration. You don't want to go through six games where every single one, you know, up to South Alabama with about nine minutes left is just, you know, this razor thin. You want to be able to blow these teams out as quickly as possible because guess what? You're going to get to a Duke. You're going to get to a Gonzaga at that point. So don't leave any, don't leave anything on the table if you can necessarily make that work. Now, let me ask you this. Tommy Lloyd, he comes in here and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, uh, Mark Few, Mark Few has seen Arizona. Tommy Lloyd has seen Arizona at its absolute apex. You got the Blake Step team. I always, I don't, <laughs> I, I always just love saying that. You got, but you know, he saw 2001, which in my opinion is the best team in school history. Real quick, what's your, in your opinion, what's the best team in school history? 2001, hands down. Okay, yeah, for sure. All right. So he, but they've all seen those teams though. So you saw the, you know, the Miller team that you know beat them in the uh, the mid 2000s or. 2010s by about 50 points or whatever. So they've seen all incarnations of Arizona basketball. Tommy Lloyd came in here, and I think the thing that's really surprised people is how flawless this transition has been. Watching him up close, Rhino, what is what has impressed you most about Coach Lloyd? I'll start with two words, no ego. Right. None. The, the guy understands uh, how this team and how any college basketball team is successful. It starts with the players and the coaching staff, right? They, ha they have control. They have authority. But at the same time, he's a guy who doesn't have to sit in the front seat on the bus, doesn't have to sit in the front seat on the airplane. He knows that the players are, are critical to the operation. Uh, but then the second piece that comes very quickly behind it, he's got a plan, uh, A, a plan B, a plan C. And I've said this phrase before. He doesn't teach guys set plays. He teaches them how to play. Right. And that 
is was on display as recently as Washington. If you watch that Washington game, what worked for us in the first game was the high post entry. Hit the high post, knocking down either high lows or quick jumpers there or kicking out for threes. We made 12 threes against Washington. Well, they shrunk the court a bit and did some things a little bit different to start the game. Then we started attacking the short corner. Yeah. Uh, and you saw Dalen Terry bust the baseline for a dunk. You saw Ben Matherin get something in the short corner. That is just a little microcosm of what I've seen Tommy's abilities and his coaching staff's abilities to make adjustments in game. He's as good as I've seen. And, you know, Luke, great preparer, unbelievable practice coach. Uh, Sean, there's a way to say this. Sean Miller knew, hey, I'm removing all doubt and all variables. Arizona basketball plays one way. Do what we do, and right. nine times out of ten, we won. Right? I mean, right. we won big with with Sean. Right. Tommy's doing it a little bit different, and it's been fun to watch because he knows these guys can play. He knows their basketball acumen, and maybe the best way to defend somebody changes from the first half to the second. What I've really got to give him is the way that he's been able to maximize all the players on this roster's ability across the board. I don't really look at anybody and say, you know what, man, we're really missing. And some injuries come into play. But you've got Christian Coloco has made progress by leaps and bounds. We don't even need to really talk about that. He's a totally different player. Uh, Julius Tabellis is, is what he is, a very, very good college power forward. And that's not meant in any form of uh, a condescension whatsoever. Um, but uh, you got Ben Matherin. Ben's the one guy that I think we would all like to be Ben every single game. But again, people also need to remember that he's also a 19, 20 year old kid. Dalen Terry to me has maximized what without having a great shot, what he's been able to do. And I wanted to get to Kerr here for a minute. I think that Tommy Lloyd is doing exactly what you need to do with a guy like Kerr Creesa, because again, the percentages aren't there, but obviously Lloyd has seen enough of him to say, you know what, sooner or later, he's going to start hitting at that 40% clip. And the one thing that we've seen from Creesa that you either have or you don't, and you saw this up close with a guy like a Miles Simon and a Mike Bibby, is that, and again, this isn't meant to compare him, but it's kind of the same uh, the, the same philosophy. You either want the big shot or you don't want the big shot. He want, Kerr, for better or worse, wants those big shots at the end of the game, and I don't think that that's something that you can really ingrain in a player, Rhino. Yeah, and, and when you watch Kerr and you see for him to be the best version of himself – he has to play with an edge. Right. He has to play with a moxie. He has to maybe take uh, take a difficult shot. What I've seen growing in him is understanding shot selection. I think that's mm -hmm. growing the most, where he's not taking 10, 11, 12 shots. Even if he's making them, uh, he's taking the right number of right. shots. And you can see that shot count go down, and it's more selective. And that's where percentages go up. Where I'm still wanting to see growth as, a, as an analyst, I'm sure you as a fan as well, mm -hmm. is – not taking those risks all the time with his right. passing. Right. Uh, he tries to fit the ball sometimes into the smallest of windows. He does take some aggressive approaches, mm -hmm. and it's not flashy necessarily. It may come across flashy. I just think he sees the game at a high level and has high confidence that he can deliver a pass that maybe only two out of ten guys can do, and sometimes it's phenomenal. I think right. of the lob to Ben Matherin against ASU in the second half. Right. I thought that was going eight rows deep in the <laughs> student section, but he had just enough arc on it that it came down perfectly. Uh, but he pushes that envelope. And, 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 you know, there's people that are concerned about our turnover percentage, and mm -hmm. I would be too, right? Number of, per, number of turnovers per number of percentages that we have in the NSA tournament, that one, two, three bad passes can lead to a right. loss in a one-game scenario tournament. The one guy that I got to give a lot of credit for, and I was, I didn't really know, but I was definitely wrong. Well, he's very pleasantly surprised me, has been Umar Ballo. Uh, I thought coming in and that he was going to be a really good practice guy. Maybe you get, you know, seven, eight minutes a game. Rhino, this guy's a guy that I'm just saying from a fan perspective, I don't think he's leaving Arizona without being an all-conference player by the time he's out of here. He is, again, and it's not like he's, you know, you're not watching the most nimble guy in the world, but he finishes around the hoop. He, I love his little push shot, even though I don't want to see that anymore. He's got great hands, and he just he understands it. He's 
he's far exceeded at least my expectations. So there's no doubt that it, when you start looking at the bigs, right, that everyone knew Azulis was going to be one of the best top two players on the team, and nothing's changed that. Right. I think everybody felt the jump that Christian Coloco made was kind of an off-season jump for him, mm -hmm. and pleasantly surprised, but it was done in the off-season. I think Balo has made the most improvement from the actual start of the right. season to now. And I agree with you. I, I felt it was eight to 10 minutes. Uh, he was going to be five fouls. He could lean on Kofi Coburn. He could lean on Hunter Dickinson. Now he's proven to be a game changer when the substitutions take place. When right. he comes in and Coach Lloyd told Balo this at ASU, go in there and change the game. Mm -hmm. He absolutely did that. And would you have ever felt that confidence in him, like you said at the start of the season, that anybody would say, Balo, go change the game right. in a in a 16 to 3 score where we're on the underside of that. Right. And, and to watch him grow in his own confidence, his he's got a soft touch around the rim. Uh, he's getting a little more confident. That little push shot at Washington State. Oh boy. I almost <laughs> didn't want the second one to go in because it's like, is he going to be Steph Curry, Jack? and threes, you know, in the next homestand. But if he makes them, no one cares. Right. Uh, but I agree. Balo might be one of those hidden players that is when you dig into Arizona, why are they 22 and two? Why are they so good on both ends of the floor? Some of the obvious things come to the foray. I think Balo and there's some other bench guys, but I think Balo might be the leading candidate for, you know, hidden X factors that a lot of people don't notice. A lot of people ask me, they say, you know, is Arizona the best team in the country? And I've kind of come up with a good cop out. I don't know that they are, but I don't put anybody above them. To me, there's teams that I think match up very well with Arizona, but there's nobody that I look at. And I've watched pretty much everybody that I look at and I say, oh, man, you know, I, I, I just don't see a way to victory for them. I think Arizona can play and beat any team in the country. Not saying it's going to happen, but they can do it, and they don't need to be shoot, playing at an A-plus performance to be able to do it right now. Yeah, first of all, let's just be excited, and you and I yes. love this, that we're even talking about this. Yeah. If they are the number one team in the country, and I know the rankings came out and a lot of people were bummed that uh, Auburn was still ranked above mm -hmm. Arizona this week, I could care less about rankings. You could right. care less about rankings. But when you talk about the group of eight, is it eight, maybe 10 teams that could right. win this whole thing? Arizona's uh, squarely in that. Squarely. There isn't a team in there that you go, oh boy, that's problems. There are challenges. Don't get me wrong. I think Kentucky's athleticism, if they're firing on all cylinders, right? You look at who, when they're at their best, could we have a real difficult time beating if we were even at our best? I think you, Rhino, I think that I think to beat Arizona, I think that you have to be big up front because that's Arizona's big, I mean, pardon the pun, big advantage right there. Mm -hmm. A team like a Duke, a team like Gonzaga that I think, you know, you can go with a Bancaro and a Williams or a Holmgren and a, a Timmy. Those are the kind of teams that I think are going to, uh, they match up better because if you're small against Arizona, there comes a point in almost every game where the Cats are almost playing volleyball at the rim on the offensive side of the court. Yeah, it just wears you down over yeah. time, right? You can hang for 30 minutes, but then that length is just too difficult. And you mentioned the big bigs, but then when it's Dale and Terry and Ben Matherin on the wings, and let's not forget to talk about Pella Larson, mm -hmm. maybe the most underwritten guy from a no defensive doubt. standpoint. This dude's versatile. He can guard big, he can guard small. And when you look at what you just said from a size standpoint, that wears you down. And mm -hmm. But I do see, you know, Kentucky's got some nice bigs, Gonzaga and, and Duke for sure sure take away some of the best parts of Arizona and some of the best things Arizona does is scores in the paint mm -hmm. and it's not traditional back to the basket post guys that are scoring in the paint it's right. Ben it's Pellets Dalen getting in there slashing but because of their size they can finish well if you can neutralize or take that away look at those games where Arizona's been right up against it in points in the paint it's been a close game they've only been outscored one time all season in the paint right. and it was a close game all right, I want to talk about Ryan Hansen, the person slash <laughs> basketball player now. First of all, Rhino, give everybody knows you obviously your work with Brian Jeffries, um, you know, some other uh, some other avenues as well. Tell me, tell the people out there a little bit about your background though, because a lot of people know, but a lot of people also don't know. 
Well, it got started back my first job with Arizona men's basketball. I was hired by none other than Jim Rosborough. Uh, and right, all roads we'll lead back to Ros, right? right? They just lead back to him. And he hired me to, to help at the summer camp uh, that uh, that Lute Olson put on every mm-hmm. summer. And over time, I developed a great relationship with the staff and became a student manager. Uh, and you touched on it. I was on the bench the year we won the title as a student manager. Tell uh, us the Reggie story. And well, yeah, so here I am, a student manager. It's the year before we win the title. Right. And so 95, traveling, 96. Traveling with the team. It's 96. And through some academic issues, some injury issues, we have eight serviceable players on the road. Mm-hmm. And we're at Oregon, and we are just played Oregon State, and we're getting ready to play Oregon there at Old Mac Court. Love that place. Right. And, and we're getting ready to play them, and we needed two guys to play on scout team, not on the team. So we picked up a football player and had him travel with us named Thomas Demps, great athlete, 6'4". Uh, and then it was, okay, pin the tail on the donkey, Rhino, you're it. And so I got put into the scout team, and which kind of cool to say I shared the same backcourt on the scout team with a 19-year NBA veteran in Jason Terry. So it's JT – and me, Kelvin Efon, which you know, mm-hmm. unbelievable great athlete, Thomas Demps, and A.J. Bramlett as right. the five-man scout team going against uh, Arizona's version in 96, right? This is a good team. This team you is got Reggie, one you shot got Reggie, you got Ben, you got Joe McClain, you got Corey, you got Miles, you got Mike D. Who experience all over the floor, right? This right. is one shot away from an Elite 18 right. that, uh, that loses to Kansas in the Sweet 16. And so I was told by the coaching staff, okay, the guy you're emulating – jacks threes so all you got to do is shoot it every time you touch it and please hit the rim and so <laughs> i did reggie geary's guarding me one of the greatest all-time defenders in, in my Arizona opinion is that history. Right. Yep. versatility i mean he's guarding corliss williamson a year earlier and in jalen rose and yeah yeah locking these dudes up well by the grace of god i make a shot i hit a three and the place goes nuts players are ribbing reggie they're going getting all after him reggie gets up in my ear and says you will not score again. And I kid you not, Mike, we had like 40 minutes left in practice. Not only did I not score, not only did I not even get a shot off, I didn't touch the ball for the rest of practice. And I learned probably more about man-to-man defense that day than I have ever watching it on the on the sidelines because yeah. of how good Reggie was at grabbing, holding, leverage, angles, he was amazing, and I learned quickly how amazing he is. I, I've always felt that 95 96 was the year, and you know, obviously, Lute went on to much better things. You won the national championship, you got a runner up, all of that. 95 96 to me was really, when I think about it, maybe his peak coaching performance. And there's been a lot of A plus performances because you got to remember Arizona up until that point you know, was always a feature in the top 25. If I'm not mistaken, 95 96 went in unranked. And that was that was uncharted waters for Arizona basketball. And for a kid like myself that just all you think about when you're younger is where are we ranked? Where are we ranked? And I just went into that season crestfallen. You lost Damon. You lost uh, you lost Rayos. You lost some guys and you're looking at the lineup. And you've got a lot of solid pieces, but nobody that had really become a star. You had a Reggie Geary. You had a Mike or a Miles coming back, obviously a big Olsen favorite. Then you had a Mike D. You had a, a Joe McClain, Corey Williams, JB, uh, Ben Davis. And, you know, within what, two weeks, they're in the top five in the nation. Obviously going on in uh, later on in the season, you had uh, got hit with some eligibility issues. But that team to me, Rhino, was the – it was the apex really of Lute's coaching job. And by the way, maybe the most underrated player outside of Chris Mills in school history, Ben Davis that year, what oh, he was man. able to do for you guys. People don't, yeah. people don't get it. And I'm going to give you the floor here. People don't get when they talk about either the best transfers in school history, the best bigs in school history, Ben Davis name is never brought up. And it absolutely should be because he was right neck and neck with Sharif Abdurrahim for conference player of the year that year. Oh, I agree with you on so many fronts, right? You come into that year having gotten tripped up in the first round the year before. Mm -hmm. So you fall off the national radar and you lost the Pac-10 player of the year in Damon Stoudemire. You mentioned a four-year, three-year starter in Ray O's, all-conference player. Mm -hmm. And so you had a lot of nice pieces, though, when you look at the individual parts. But could they put it together? Did they have enough? And and remember, Miles and Michael Dickerson were young. Mm -hmm. They were sophomores at this point, unproven, right? Right. They They were competent. 
complementary guys. Uh, and that team was tough, high basketball IQ across the board and the quality of the individual people. I would argue that group was as good as any. When you look, I mean, here's Joseph Blair now on the bench with the Wizards. Right. Joe McClain is is the investment wizard. He's the investment whisperer of all right. great NBA players. He's actually in Rhino's ear right now. <laughs> right now. Uh, but we've talked about Reggie and, and you talked about underrated. Big, Big Ben and Michael Dickerson, possibly two of the most underrated guys in school history. But they came together, and I, I like how you put it. They came together, but Coach Olson knew the pieces and knew how to put them in the right places. And that team absolutely overachieved based on the outsider's view, but absolutely achieved what they all expected. And kind of look back, I think each one of them feel like, oh, we laid the real foundation right. for that national title run. Well, all right, so you go into the next year then, 96-97. By the way, you win the national championship. Ryan Hansen on that team right there. Well, oh, you know, sure we, be, yeah. oh, but I wanted to ask you about this. Tell me, or I'll, I'll go with my view. I just remember the hype around Mike Bibby coming in was unlike, and keep in mind, this is right before the, pre, this is kind of the pre-internet stage. This is when you're relying on like Hoop Scoop and uh, Bob. Uh, uh, Bob Gibbons. Bob Gibbons. Yes, exactly. But all you hear about is this kid coming in who, besides Kobe Bryant, is maybe the best player in the country. And so I go to watch him at Sal Point. And keep in mind, I'm all, at the time I'm, uh, shoot, I'm 11 or 12. And keep in mind, this is in the era where all the guards are flashy. You come out, you've got an Allen Iverson, a Stephon Marbury, a Baron Davis, everybody that just looks the part. I'm watching him at Sal Point when he comes to play his senior year, and I'm expecting to see this guy that's jumping out of the gym. He was a sneaky good athlete. People that think he wasn't a good athlete are crazy. But it wasn't what you were expecting to see. And I remember thinking to myself, maybe I need to see some more. I watched him at that red-blue game. Uh, that year, right before you guys went off to Springfield. And at that point, I'm like, all right, that's what they're talking about right there. Thank Tell you. me a little bit about the hype and just about what Bibby was coming in. You know, that whole class was hyped pretty highly yeah. because we also Steven. had Steven Jackson in that class, which might have changed the dynamics. Mm -hmm. But that was a very highly rated class. Eugene Edgerson was like the 30th best player right. in the in that class Bennett as well. Bennett Davidson, Pac, or a, a Juco, Juco player. player. Yeah. And, and so when you look at what Bibbs was all about – uh, I think you're right. Not flashy in a high school setting, not dunking on you. Uh, really, his jump shot was not quick and burst. He it was right. just always under control. Uh, but everybody knew uh, internally what this guy was all about. I mean, the ball was essentially thrown to him when he stepped on campus and said, this is your team. Even right. though Miles Simon was going to ultimately become MOP and everybody knows that. Story. Mike D was the scoring leader early on. Right. Yep. Early on. Heck, Mike right. D was a scoring leader in 96. Right. Seven and 98. Mm -hmm. That's why he's the most underrated player yeah. outside of maybe Ben Davis or Chris Mills. That's for another podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but I just watching Bibbs in Springfield and, and here he is. And you said it from the red blue game. First game, we go out to Springfield mass. We're playing North Carolina, Dean Smith. They've got Ed Coda, who was very highly rated mm -hmm. at that time as St. well. St. Thomas Moore. Yep. And, and those guys battled each other. And Mike, Mike Bibby and Michael Dickerson were the two best players on the floor with Antoine Jamison, Vince Carter, Shimon uh, Williams, Oak Elijah. I mean, it was a star studded right. group and you knew right then and there control of the game. This right. guy had the ball on a string like a yo-yo and he could throw it out there and pull it back. He was amazing. I just remember thinking before the game, cause Dickie V was on the call and this was back to when all the big games, uh, Dick Vitale got all the big games. So mm -hmm. for a 12, 11 year old, if it was Dick Vitale on there, you were all about it. And I remember on his uh, pregame, and I'll never forget it. He says, "We've got two of the best young. Uh, we got two of the best diaper dandy point guards in the country. We're going to see who's better here." And I remember after like five minutes, I'm like, uh, "Well, Ed Code is nice. This is a different animal entirely, right here." Yeah, but he put it on display, obviously, at the Final Four and controlled. I mean, Kentucky known for pressing yeah. all season long in the national title game, called off the dogs because of Mike Bibby. Well, and the thing was crazy in that Kentucky game and uh, is that you got Wayne Turner, who is one of the quickest dudes in the entire country. You had an Anthony Epps. You had a Ron Mercer. They were built to press. I, I know that uh, – what's his name? Uh, Derek Anderson missed the majority. Right. But when you've got a guy like that, Mike Bibby, and like you said, they had to call off the dogs – 
you don't see that very often from a Rick Pitino, a vintage Rick Pitino coach team too. Yeah. Yeah. To make that adjustment and say, we, we like our chances better doing something we've never done all season. Right. You know, that's an interesting shift. Right. Rhino, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. This has been 30 minutes of awesomeness. Uh, we'll definitely have you on again soon. I appreciate you and all the work you and Brian do. I, I appreciate being on and, and you're the best, Mike. It's been great to, to catch up. All right, Rhino. We'll talk to you soon, my man. Thanks, buddy. Right. Okay, thanks. All right, Ryan Hansen right there. Obviously, one of the, probably the coolest dude when you think about, if I could have anybody's career, it would definitely be Ryan Hansen's, quite frankly, because you get to play with the Cats, you get to manage the Cats, it doesn't get any much better than that, and you get to call the Cats. So, Rhino's got a pretty good gig going on right there. All right, let me tell you guys a little bit about the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Code word PHNX. Here's the deal. You throw down $1 on an NBA game, and if that team wins, you get $150 in free plays. That simple, that easy. Make it happen. Make it work. Eligibility restrictions do apply. Arizona only. You got a gambling problem, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. They'll get you all taken care of. Take on, Like I said, I would probably pick the Warriors in those games. All right. That was absolutely awesome. Rhino is, uh, I thought Rhino hit on some really, really good points about this team. First and foremost, is that when you look at the margin for error, or excuse me, the uh, margin of victory, you're looking at a team right here that has one of the best in school history. And, you know, for the younger crowd out there that don't know, this is a team that, um, this is a program that is one of the 15 best programs by any measure. Any, any way you want to put it out, college basketball, Arizona is in there. And for Arizona to have that kind of win margin right now, I think it'd be 11.7 or something, that's you know that that's absolutely crazy, and I uh, it just goes to show you what exactly they really have to go here. All right, guys, let's get to some comments here. I do apologize, Ricky Garrett. Always appreciate the kind words, my man. All right, uh, Andre Veras, Rhino. Uh, why would Arizona make the Final Four? Why will Arizona not make the Final Four? All right, Dre. I'm obviously not Rhino. He knows a lot more than me. Arizona is going to make the final four if they do for one really easy reason. It's because they're better than everybody else. And I think we've seen that one through five, they just fit in ways that other teams don't. If they don't, I think it's going to come back to, and he's made some big plays, but I think it's going to come back to Kirk Creasa kind of being a weak link on the defensive side of the court against a team like a Kentucky against a team like a, uh, you know, a Duke, there's not a lot of really easy ideal matchups for him, but the kids obviously proven a lot of people wrong in the past. So those would be kind of the two things that I would look at and um, offensively finishing around the hoop. I think teams, if a team's going to beat Arizona, they got to be big. And if they're not big, then I think you're going to be dealing with a lot of different issues right there. And uh, we're going to get to some, Anthony Humbert's got some really good, uh, Anthony Humbert's got some really, really good takes right here. But first, I want to tell you about Athletic Greens. Okay, this is our new partner and has a product that I've been pretty much using every day, even up here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Basically, it's one scoop. You take care of it. It's got everything you need to be able to get through the day. It sleep it gives you better sleep quality, has over 7,000 five-star reviews, 7,000. And it costs you less than $3 a day. Plus, you're investing in your health, which is going to save you money in the long term. It's that simple. It's that easy. All right. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash wildcats. Again, that is athleticgreens backslash wildcats. All right. Now, let's get to some more of these questions. Ryan, uh, let's see. Anthony Humbert. Does Arizona have the best one through eight rotation in the nation? And again, these questions are directed towards Rhino. Um, I was nerding out and wasn't paying enough attention, so I should have on that. My uh, Anthony, my take is that Arizona does. Because one through eight, Arizona has literally no roster filler. And we've all seen it before. There's guys on the team that Arizona's got a great seven-man rotation or a six-man rotation. But one player comes in and you think to yourself, eh, not that good. Or we're going to we're gonna be exposed here a little bit. That's not what happens with any of these guys. When you're bringing in a guy like an Umar Ballo off the bench, who we just talked about, and I believe is going to be an all-conference type guy, that's something that a lot of teams are not able to bring in. When you bring in a Justin Kyer, who would be a power five starter at most schools, including a lot of top 25 teams, or a Pella Larson. By the way, every single game, 
for the last three games, I have been tweeting out, Pella, my bad. You might be saying, Mike, what are you talking about? I wasn't in on Pella Larson. I didn't see it. Guess what? I was short-sighted. I was wrong. Pella Larson has been perfect for them. As, uh, as Rhino put it, this is a guy that is one of the – I wish he would shoot more, to be honest with you. He's absolutely a fantastic shooter. He's defensively – it doesn't look like he should be a great defender because it's not like he's got the elite lateral movement, but he's able to anticipate. He's able to use his strength, and I think that's something that is incredibly underrated, and he stopped turning the ball over. He's made good decisions with the ball, and I think that's something that you've certainly got to tip your cap to for him, mm. Pella. As always, my bad. And again, you should check out the uh, Go PHNX. Go to the website. You should get membership right here. And if you do, you get a free Back the A t-shirt. It's that simple. It's that easy. Again, uh, not anything that's really difficult right there. And uh, the AZ Wildcats podcast, subscribe. If you go to the website and you're subscribed, you get all of the best coverage from all the best teams in the state, from the best people out there. You got the Sun Devils, you got the Cardinals, you got the Coyotes, you got the Diamondbacks, you got the Suns. This is the best time to hop in there, so make it happen. All right, everyone, just want to give you a quick little update on me, if you care, before I leave. This is where I was earlier today. As a lot of people know, my dog Bruno is uh, undergoing some radiation treatment uh, up here in Colorado, so we've taken the show on the road and uh, I actually was able to do some scene checking today with my guy. Uh, we're going to go pick him up here after this. Um, but again, oh, DraftKings Sportsbook, one more time, code word PHNX. Throw down $1 on a game. A lot of games coming up tonight. Football's over. Time to get into basketball. And what's a better way to make it into basketball than be putting in something that makes you interested? That's called money. So DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX, you throw down $1, you get $150 in free plays. If you're, that team wins, make it happen. It's fun. It makes the game go by a little bit easier. But I do want to thank everybody out here for following me here. I'm going to be up here for about another week as uh, my, my, uh, my guy Bruno is uh, undergoing some radiation treatment. Um, he's doing well. I'm about to go pick him up right now. It's a fact they called while I was on with, uh, with, I was on with Rhino. But uh, again, I appreciate all of you. This thing's taken off. We had a really high uh, listenership today, viewership. You are all the best. Again, I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I can't thank you all enough for listening in here, trying to bring you the best stuff I can. Tomorrow, we got Michael Lev coming on from the Arizona Daily Star, making his debut to talk a little bit of Arizona football in a new era. Again, for Ryan Hansen, I'm Mike Luke. Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. Mm -hmm.